Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Raj with Praveen. We are the co-founders of Hidden Levers, a risk platform for financial services folks everywhere. Uh, today we'll be talking about the new Fed and what's, uh, what's with their hawkish tone. This is the April War Room. Welcome. The War Room is a uh, session that we do monthly to update scenarios and uh, uh, create new scenarios. In this case, we'll be updating the Fed unwinding scenario. Uh, it's overdue, but we have had so much flux in the economy that we've been busy. Uh, basically, the tech scenario kind of played out in reality check around the thing uh, in the middle of all this, and this is not even worth talking about at this moment. Uh, maybe, maybe as we have time, we can afford to do it. As for the uh, session on Fed and uh, perhaps inversion of the yield curve, we'll be talking about business cycles and how yield curves move and why they're so predictive. Uh, we'll talk about the Fed, and you know, even with uh, fresh blood in in the chairs, there's still a lot of fatigue in the team, and so their their kind of strategy is getting played. We'll show how that's not really working, and, and so maybe causing the hiccups that are happening. And then we'll introduce the updated scenario on Fed hawk, new Fed hawks, and that is because of a, 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 a personnel change at the top, but also a tone change, and then uh, a com committed. Uh, nature of uh, of their moves. Praveen? All right. Well, yeah, Raj, thanks for the intro. And let's get started with the skinny where we just kind of go over why this is right, but with the change in leadership that you mentioned and, and what else is, has been going on recently in the economy. Well, one, one thing for sure is there is new leadership. And, uh, you know, without the dovish Janet Yellen, now you have another face to recognize. Another old white man in office. Uh, the Trump tax plan is uh, totally priced in now. That's what we've seen. Uh, if you look on hidden lever scenarios, uh, you know the the upside scenario uh, around 2,800 on the S and P was touched. You can see that there in the bottom right. So this business cycle, right. you know, we, there's a blog about it on the site. Uh, Praveen, let some. You know, if you guys read our blog, there is a nice article about uh, the business cycle being in ex extra innings and what that's doing to valuations. Uh, so that's another reason it's right. <clears throat> and of course, what you're seeing everywhere is the Paul Revere's of finance uh, uh, talking about tenure at three handle and how that signals a big shift in the economy. And even, uh, you know, whether it's Bloomberg, CNBC, all the majors, uh, they're talking about how earnings uh, season, which has been kind of rosy, doesn't matter. All the recovery in the, in the tech doesn't matter. Where, where rates are at uh, three in the first figure, uh, that is completely uh, hijacking any sort of upside uh, optimism uh, in in markets. Right. And I, I would just add, so our plan with the Trump tax plan, will be moving that. Uh, what, what tends to happen, of course, when a scenario completely sort of plays out is we move that into the historical setting. And so you'll see that soon as a historical scenario, as opposed to uh, a scenario that's forward looking. All right, let's take a look now on hidden levers and we can see, uh, we'll take a look at a couple of different things. One would be if I jump out here and I go to my hidden levers, which I've logged in. And actually what I'm, what I'm looking at here is in the, the data center under economic data. If I go there and uh, we actually, it starts on the active tab. One thing I would note is, so the active tab measures uh, across all of the different economic indicators, what's moving the fastest relative to its own typical sort of uh, standard deviation or rate of movement. We do see that the 10-year yield up at 3.03 .03 as of today, that it's actually, uh, you know, rising on the list, as is the 30-year treasury, five-year treasury, you know, the one year or 12 months. So we see a lot of rate, you know, rate rising starting to show up in the, um, in the active levers, sort of with their quick positive motion. We do have a rates and bonds section just to show uh, those of you who aren't familiar with the data center. And you can you can see data on things like, you know, 10-year yields over time, the treasury spread. We're gonna be talking a lot about this today, but this is where you can see the 210 treasury spread and see uh, how that has uh, changed over time. And of course, the crucial bit of information we'll be looking at is how often and when has it penetrated below the 0% level. So that, that's what we kind of think of as a yield curve inversion. But, uh, but that data is, is all available here. 
and, uh, and and that's definitely part of what powers today's uh, war room. In addition, we'll look at the scenario further, but we'll go into the scenario library and we can see the uh, the new the update on um, I'll just point to it briefly on the the new Fed hawks. That's right there up in the trending scenarios. All right, Praveen, let's jump back able, in. So are you able to show uh, the ten-year Treasury yield against GDP? Sure. So if we were to quickly do that, we could do it in our. <clears throat> we can pull up a chart of. I pull up uh, ten year and GDP growth, and uh, I think one of the relationships that I know, Raj, that you were you were interested in, and let me make this a bit larger, and we'll maybe extend the time frame as well. We go to a long longer time frame here. It's a bit noisy, but what we can see is, and so this is GDP growth. We can see that uh, quite often in history, they have kind of moved together, that you get sort of, you know, uptrends in GDP growth actually can match with uptrends in 10-year uh, in, in, in rates, you know, and then similarly downtrends during, this re during the Great uh, Recession, for instance, the financial crisis, sharp downtrends in GDP growth are matched to sharp downtrends in rates. So there is oftentimes that positive correlation. Now, that hasn't really been so as strong recently. There's been a bit of that correlation, you can see it here, but uh, because rates had fallen near zero for so long and, and even long-term rates had fallen to all-time lows as of only two years ago, uh, you know, that had been a bit diminished. And so one of the questions we're asking is, will that relationship return? If you, if you go to the short term there, the main thing I want to show, you know, this kind of sets the stage is sure. there was this notion of, the new normal once rates went to zero and you know we had some GDP recovery but rates were still low but you can see there in the past uh, since July 2016 till now we have had hints of the old normal which is GDP pulling up rates and uh, you know the the kind of hope with all the bit with uh, the Trump administration and the huge push from last year the 27 extreme push uh, with business friendly business friendly policies and uh, maybe uh, a, a big pop in the GDP is 10 year rising based on that. But that relationship uh, where they travel together, that is the old normal where GDP pulls up uh, 10 year treasuries. And so, you know, that really sets the background for and whatever upside we talk about from here. I know the past uh, couple months of volatility haven't made that have made people way more interested in downside risk protection. But you know, we do want to maintain our duty to you, which is always carefully consider the good, the bad, and the ugly versions of these scenarios. Okay, Definitely. Okay, let's talk about, if these guys have no time, then uh, what, what are the few things that they should take away? Yeah, so there are some, some key takeaways, and as we'll show, um, you know, the relationship in more detail, but between the idea of a yield curve inversion so the chart that we showed where that 210 spread is going negative, that there is a lag of about one year on average between when that happens and when a recession happens. And so that's key to realize that there is a strong predictive power throughout history, uh, you know, those two events being correlated. Uh, and, and recessions in almost all cases are also tied to market corrections. So, so very important takeaway. The exact timing can be different from one year, but, but you do have a, uh, a leading indicator with with the yield curve uh i think uh the other really salient point about the yield curve you know moving to this bottom right point is that we're not that far away even with the 10-year rising over the last couple of days uh the 210 spread is only around 50 basis points so that means that if um, the fed is intent on two hikes maybe even three hikes for the balance of the year but certainly two hikes that pretty much brings us to a flat yield curve maybe even to an inverted yield curve. So, so we're really getting close, you know, within 2018 to this potential um, event. And then, uh, Raj, I know you were asking this question about, you know, why are we rising rates with no inflation? You know, that kind of speaks to it as well. That's, that's the new Fed hawks, right? Right. So we've been seeing, I guess there's this heavy assumption of GDP growth, and that'll be, the, the rates will just be keeping up with that. But, you know, that inflation component, we have not even touched two. Yeah, maybe restaurants are charging more and real estate's going up in price. But let's face it, 
inflation as it's measured, uh, oil yes. prices, uh, normal cost of goods, those are as cheap as ever. So really, there's no inflation to beg for those. Uh, interest rates to contain right. that inflation. Well, we've, bou- we've bounced um, off the, the deflationary era, but we really haven't gotten into a high inflation era, I guess is probably a fair, okay. fair point, right? In the middle and anything. Um, okay, and then, and then the other part on the top right, you see that cute puppy uh, stuff there in the, in the vent. And that's really where we are um, with GDP. You know, one of the magic points that people aren't talking about, um, no matter where they are in the political affiliation or in the press, I mean, the population growth is what increases GDP. And, you know, as you know, this country is more full than it was in 1980 uh, by a lot. And so, so that is what caused GDP increase. And so if we don't have that population growth, um, uh, because of many oh. things hidden levers have been discussing over the past few years uh, in terms of, you know, demographics is our destiny. And so that this GDP in the twos is more likely without that population growth as opposed to the good old days of the 80s and 90s of 4% GDP growth. You know, there was a huge population growth to substantiate that. Not so much these days. Definitely. All right. We, <coughs> excuse me, we got a question, actually, that's apropos to our next section, which we're, gonna, we're talking about the yield curve and business cycles and, and how business cycles and market cycles relate as well. And so if we dive right in, the first point, you know, because this is a, you know, so much of the yield curve, the shape of the yield curve, and of course interest rates is due to Federal Reserve actions. We wanted to just revisit that quickly. And, and what the chart here is showing is unemployment and inflation. And why those two metrics? Well, because those are the two components of the Federal Reserve mandate to so minimize unemployment, try to keep it uh, as low as possible or to, you know, to maximize employment on the other hand. But that's traditionally been viewed as getting the unemployment rate down to around 4%. And then, and then keep stable inflation. If it's too low, try to drive it up toward 2%. If it's too high, then try to drive it back down toward that number. So with that in mind, if we look at this sort of history, one thing we notice is that generally speaking, a lot of these hikes have occurred when there were spikes in inflation. That's kind of the, the uh, maybe been the primary driver of Fed action in the past whether it was in the 80s, you know, a couple of times, even in the late 90s, you know, a rising inflation trend and, and hype cycle, you know, accelerating then, certainly in the 2000s as well. Uh, and so that's been kind of a, a common thread. There has been, of course, some recovery in inflation recently. It's still not really above. In fact, if we even just go back a few years, we were down at zero. And so, um, so, so now perhaps, this is the Fed trying to get ahead of this fact that unemployment has really gotten to a, a very low level. But at any rate, here we are with, uh, with rate hikes. Even though inflation is not yet at the kinds of levels going back up near 3 4%, even 5%, when historically you would have seen um, rate hikes. All right, so jumping into the business cycle a little bit now, so that's the interest rate side of things. The chart at top left, and this is going to dovetail with some other information we'll provide, but just to put this current recovery or expansion phase in context, this is uh, the, all of the post-war expansion. So starting in 49, you've got all the way until the current expansion, how many months long they are, and then also what is the total change in GDP from the start point. So we can see that Despite the length of the current expansion, the Hi, this is Praveen. Praveen, it's Raj from Hidden Lovers. Hi, Raj. Sorry about that. I cut out for a moment. Let's hop back in. But uh, 
that's the left hand side really talking about GDP expansion and how slow the current recovery has been. But even though it's been a slow expansion, we are one of the longest expansions in history, certainly in post-war history. And so there's a risk that um, as we get up into uh, record territory here, that uh, as the cycles end, right? That's one risk. Now, on the other side of this chart, we wanted to look at, and this is actually, I think, Richard, uh, you had asked a question about, <clears throat> excuse me, which, which types of investments or which types of sectors are appropriate for which uh, points in the business cycle. That's really what this second chart is about. And this is based on research that was done by uh, Standard Poor's looking at uh, the last 100 years of business cycles. So what they concluded was that sort of, and if we look at this, the yellow is the uh, stock market cycle and the blue is the business cycle. And so generally speaking, the sort of business cycle theory is that the stock market tends to lead a little bit. So coming out of a recession, technology tends to be one of the leaders, perhaps transportation as well and services. These tend to be the, the, the growth areas that you want to be in. And then on the flip side, traditionally healthcare, utilities, staples, just the, de the defensive kind of plays have been the ones that uh, would, be, would be stronger investments. So perhaps not uh, that different from uh, what your expectation would be, the traditionally defensive sectors are the ones that you might want to rotate toward in uh, the tail end of the business cycle. That's really what this is illustrating in, 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 in terms of sectors going from the recession all the way through full recovery and then back to recession again. Okay. All right, so that's business cycle getting into the yield curve and just some quick 101. I know we've looked at some, some similar content, but really for this first chart, this comes from a uh, San Francisco Federal Reserve paper. And I would just note the quote. It's as simple as this. Every U.S. recession in the past 60 years was preceded by a negative term spread, which is the term that they used to uh, refer to. In their case, the 110 spread, the one-year treasury versus the 10-year treasury, but it's very similar if you look at the 210 as well. But every recession was preceded by an inverted yield curve. And you can see it on the chart. You can see where this goes below zero, and then the shaded area is a recession. So it's really quite consistent. And there are very few indicators, uh, you know, within the economic literature that have this degree of consistency. So that's fairly important. Now, the second question that's worth tying to that is, okay, that's uh, treasury spreads and recessions, but what about markets? And we see as well that there is that correlation that when the yield curve has inverted, it preceded, <coughs> it preceded the last several major S&P drops that were associated with recessions. Now, markets move down for a variety of reasons, but the big drops often tend to be recession, uh, related to recessions. And so that happened in 2000 and in 2008. Prior to that, you did have the yield curve go negative. In 1990, before that recession, same thing, but you know it's kind of dwarfed by the later moves in the S&P. But this is this is actually a 20% drop. That little uh, bit in the chart there. This isn't a log scale chart, so you can't see it as well. But at any rate, so that uh, you know that drop is still meaningful, and and all of those are preceded by yield curve inversion. Well, Praveen, even for the most basic, uh, um, let's say investor, you know what's what's really the meaning for them of the twos, ten spread in verdict. Why should ten-year treasuries uh, have more? Uh, why should that be a positive ratio as opposed to negative? Right. I, don't know, I think that's a good question. You know, in terms of the market, we'll get into some of these hard numbers a little further. But <clears throat> no, it's a great question, and, and there's a simple answer for that. Right. The simple answer is that if you are going to lend your money to a borrower for a longer and longer period of time, take the extreme case. If you're going to lend your money to someone for a day or for a month, you know, you might decide that you want an interest rate, you know, let's just say for, for simple terms, say you want 2 or 3% for that to a very low risk borrower. That that's what, you know, you're the bank and that's what you ask for. On the flip side, what about if they want to borrow the money for 30 years? Well, if they want to borrow the money for 30 years and you don't have a certainty of getting all of your principal back for 30 years, then uh, you're taking substantially more risk because uh, the world can change a lot in 30 years. So depending yeah, on that borrower's credit, where do they definitely miss, demand you know? more longer time frames definitely demand more interest. So why does why would it ever go inverted? 
why would someone take more interest for the shorter term in uh, treasury? Right, and so, so, so that begs the question, doesn't it? How do these rates actually end up inverting? The answer being, you know, so again, this is all driven by markets and it's driven by bond prices or by bond markets. You can buy or sell the 10-year. You can buy or sell short-term bonds. And so when the treasury, when the 10-year treasury is relatively cheap, meaning, you know, at these times when it inverts, that's big, that means net-net that more people are buying long-term bonds. So, well, why would they do that? In part, they're buying long-term bonds if they don't feel good about the stock market's future prospects or about the economy's future prospects. That's when you get defensive and you put your money into long-term bonds. So. Uh, in a way, all of this stuff that we're looking at here is this is sort of the bond market's prognostication on what might be happening in the future. And this is the, the way to read what the bond market is saying. So okay. it's really, really so, as so simple as that. If the, if the takeaway we read about was a one, one year time lag and that inversion happens, so uh, if that inversion happens in, in the remainder of 2018, we can expect that recession sometime in 2019. That does gel with a lot of analyst forecast maybe. Right. And well and if we look at this we can see some hard data now, right? So this chart below, you know, well the chart above is showing the red line, that's when the yield curve inverted. Uh and then uh the the shaded period is the recession. Uh well actually sorry, the shaded period here is actually market correction specifically. And so we can see that back in nineteen eighty for instance, the lag was only three months and the S P drawdown that was uh preceded by that yield curve inversion was twenty seven percent and then twenty percent in eighty eight or rather in 1990 was when the correction started. So longer lag there, but again, if you look at the average here, this is how you're getting around a year of lag. Because you've got, sometimes the lag is very short, sometimes it's longer, averaging around that amount of time. And uh, in terms of the average correction here, we're seeing pretty substantial numbers because of course the correction, excuse me, with the financial crisis was, was as we all know, it, you know, extraordinary when you look at the total drawdown, the max drawdown. And, uh, and then even from the early 2000s as well. So all of this uh, <clears throat> averaged out, you're looking at something in the neighborhood of uh, a third or in the mid 30s in terms of drawdown and around a year in terms of lag time uh, when the yield curve inverts. And so not a, not a pretty overall picture. And, and that's why uh, you know, it really is so important to uh, watch. And for the analysts in the room, you know, the yield can, curve inversion talking about it at that wonky level is just there's no footnotes needed for your investors I doubt that that's of interest to them and getting them interested even though it is an alarm bell is probably not your best bet your best bet might be to say well people are paying more for short-term uh, debt just as a safety move and you know that's that takes care of it so this this war room as opposed to how to explain esoteric economics to your client it's more about how you know what you what should you be thinking about internally? Okay. Right. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit. So, Raj, you mentioned this notion of Fed fatigue, and and I think it's twofold, isn't it? You know, one, it's um, that the Fed has been on the sort of QE or related policies for such a long time, and now they're you know in the process of raising rates, of rolling some of that back. But of course, we can't forget that. Uh, the balance sheet is still many, many, many times the size that it was, say, in 2007. Right. And that they hasn't been reversed yet, right? Unwinding, right? I mean, that, <clears throat> right. That kind of yelling uh, motif of unwinding from the uh, post taper, that still sticks even with uh, the new Fed chair in place? Well, so, the, and so that's the question. Like, how is that unwinding going to, uh, going to play out now? And, uh, and also, we, we've seen. In some of the earlier slides, we've definitely seen some seen that maybe we're getting late in the business cycle. I thought it would be interesting to look at it from another economic indicator's perspective. Here we're looking at unemployment rates and the fact that those really bottomed in 2000 very much coincident with the market's crash. The same thing happened actually in 2007. They bottomed just a little bit before the markets crash. And so that does, uh, you know, that kind of begs the question, right? We seem to be down around those same sort of record, that record territory. And, you know, what does that mean? 
for us up here, you know, is this going to to lead to, a, you know, a major correction? Sure, we've had a minor correction so far this year, yeah, but uh, but does that lead to something more substantial? Does that lead to the end of the business cycle, which would be something more substantial? And, and then the second piece, I think, so the Fed, back to the Fed fatigue concept, <clears throat> they really want to get rates back to something normal, get back to that old normal, which, we, you know, which we're going to talk more about, right? And and this is their the so-called Fed dot plot, where this is like <clears throat> these circles represent what the Fed governors think rates are going to be in a certain year. And so as of the last Fed meeting, for the end of 2018, the Fed governors think their consensus is two and a quarter percent. Well, right now they're at 1.5. So what does that mean? That means that there might still be three rate hikes on the cards in 2018. And if that's true, that means that we could invert as early as Q4 of this year. The only thing that would present that is if the, prevent that is if the 10 year were to rise substantially. What it's risen so far is not enough to present, prevent that. And so but this is still very much on the table that if the Fed really wants to keep raising rates, that, that we could actually have that yield curve invert because they're, they're pressing ahead to get to, um, get to something that resembles normal. Okay. Yeah, it seems like a lot of risk in that in that so move, is right? That, but is that old normal even possible? You know, the one, the like a four handled GDP and uh, <coughs> ten year rise. I mean, three 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 percent plus uh, on the ten year. That there's some some might take that as pretty good news. No. Well, no, I think that many would take that as pretty good news because we've been stuck in the two handle for the basic in, basically for the entirety of the expansion. We saw, um, and I think that that shows here as well. Actually, Raj, if I, if I jump forward for a moment, maybe you can speak to this. Um, but the expansion hasn't been very strong, right? Yeah, I mean it, it hasn't. For for as you know, don't confuse a stock market rising with a economy jumping up too. You know, those are not one to one. And so here we see that in stark contrast, right? What were the economic gains? This is a question we were asking ourselves because it's not talked about in the news that much. What were the, just contrasting the actual GDP gains uh, since the financial crisis with the S&P gains, right? What are those? And so you see that there, uh, uh, about 28, oh, just under 30% growth total in the economy since the financial crisis, uh, but a 10x move in the S&P of that. And is that even, like, is that real? Is it real? And, and so you look back uh, against other recoveries, and let's say the the, the dot com days, right? That whole uh, era of Microsoft and uh, Oracle coming up. You've got uh, average annual GDP that's double um, that's that's double where we were for the, since the financial crisis, and the same amount of S and P gain, right? So that great era of the 90s where the boomers made their money and uh, before retirement, right? They, that is the same S&P gain as we've had for the past uh, nine years, but with half the GDP growth. So, you know, that's, that begs a big question. Is that with such weak economic gains, does it support that parabolic asset price uh, movement? Uh, we don't think so. And so if that's the case, then it's, if, there's, if it's built a little bit on, on more fluff than substance, then, then when it comes down, it might also go right through that fluff in a landing in a hard place. Uh, you see that in the Fed stress test, even Praveen, maybe we can show that uh, right now. The, uh, the Fed stress test, the assumption of the downside is not like a one third correction or 25% correction as it has been in the past few years. It's, I think it's in the 60s, is that accurate? Right, that's right, and, and it's been adjusting. If I go to scenarios, if I jump into the scenario library and we look at the Fed stress test right here, what we see with their severely adverse scenario is uh, minus 64, 65%. So actually, there's a teeny bit of progress, but the actual minus 65 is what they called for from the starting point of 2018 if a, if a severely adverse scenario played out. And part of the reason for that is because uh, equity prices are um, at relatively high valuations. So this is the first time that the Fed has called for not called for it because they're not making a projection, but that in their worst case scenario that they look at, 
that they asked the big banks to stress test for an S&P that's sub 1,000, which is, uh, you know, pretty far from, uh, from where we've been uh, ever since the recovery got, got underway. And so that's right. definitely if you look an indication. at the 2017 stress test for 2016, the, the severely adverse scenario was uh, in the 30s. You know, down 30 percent, down down 33. Well, I think so on the severely like, adverse side, yeah. it, it was more than this, it was more than this, but it was le- I was sorry, it was more than the adverse, but it was still it was never above 50 percent. It was below 50 percent, and now we're getting up into the the two thirds range. So it's a substantial increase, and uh, no, and I think that dovetails with the idea that um, that this is not necessarily supported. Basically, that the Fed wants to make sure that banks are prepared for even uh, steeper risks. Just, in the, just you know, precisely because of what markets have done over the past year or two. So that's um, exactly. <clears throat> that's for sure. Well, that's the that's you know, kind of looking at the economic versus market in you know, that ratio. And I, I thought that was another way of looking at it was that you know you <clears throat> you're absolutely right. It's the same S and P gain for compared to the 90s. But even if we look at like the 80s, I mean, the S and P move was only it was not even three times the GDP move. Versus today, the S and P move is 11 times the GDP move. So you know that's just a huge difference, and uh, it shows shows you know maybe just just how fast we've been moving on the markets lately. On the other side yeah. of the equation, you know, so so Raj, I think all of that to sum it up, basically what that says is that Fed policy <clears throat> has really driven asset prices way more than the real economy, right? Yeah, it's Fed policy has driven driven those asset prices. If you do want a real uh, handle on where the economy is, you know, for economic gains, we found a wonderful uh, resource just uh, in that was published oh, yeah, in January. Like- Ed Yardini, who is uh, kind of broken off on his own, uh, we put a link to it there. It's about 20 charts. You see one there, uh, GDP without government uh, contribution, where we're at, uh, and a comparison of the different expansions since, uh, since the Kennedy era. So if you click that link, you'll get to that, and you'll see many more. I think about 20 pages of those charts, and a real finger on the pulse of where the economic gains have been since the the uh, beginning of this this expansion, so 2009. Um, do you want right. to click that to show? <clears throat> yeah, no, it's there. Uh, you know, and when, when we when we distribute the deck, then then you'll have access to it, and you can. And the deck, of course, will be available um, either later today or tomorrow. We'll we'll be posting it. On the scenario page, so you'll you'll have access to that. Uh, but I did want to make sure that we also talked about the other half of the equation, which is one half of the equation. Okay, so so now we've shown that the Fed's policies have really driven um, stock market gains a lot more than uh, you know than GDP growth. So that's GDP growth. But then also in, ter- in job terms, this chart at the top left of of the slide we're looking at here, you know, noting that each recovery is weaker than the last. So this is showing every recovery since World War II. How many months did it take to get back to the same number of jobs in the United States? So that's basically when do you get back to zero? And it's almost like clockwork that recoveries have been taking longer and longer and longer. For instance, this is 2001, where it took almost four years to get back to uh, the same level of employment prior to the recession. And then this is 1990, which is the recession immediately prior to that, 81 immediately prior to that. And so the last four recessions in a row, it's been taking longer and longer. And now here we are with the current, uh, not current, but rather the post-financial crisis recession. It took over six years to get back to the same level of 2008 employment. It eventually happened, but it wasn't until that, you know, 2014 sort of time frame that we got there. And, uh, <clears throat> on the on the other on the flip side, of course, we already saw how much stock market gains were, but just want to note another labor force or sort of employment um, indicator would be labor force participation in the early part of the stock market recovery and sort of tentative economic recovery. We had you know sort of 2009 all the way until 2014, labor force participation was actually dropping, 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 dropping steadily. So we steadily had a lower percentage of the uh, American population in employment, while at the same time, the market was exploding upward at a very, very rapid pace. So, uh, you know, that's just another sort of point of evidence that what did the Fed's 
policy achieve, you know, it, it, it achieved a huge market win, but, but not very much labor force benefit. And, and then to your point here, not, not really much gross economic growth benefit either. It got us to, to neutral at best. Yeah. And so that, you know, we, in, in the unwinding scenario that we've had in place until today, uh, the reason that the Fed might put the brakes on rate hikes, meaning let the economy run a bit hot, let inflation climb up if they can, um, without worrying too much, was to, to change the dynamic on that labor force participation. If I go back to that slide, Praveen, you can see it bouncing. Yeah. It, did, it, it did change direction, labor force participation. One more. And oh, yeah, back to it. Sure. Yeah, there you go. It, it did change direction, but you can just see it bouncing still below that in the low 60s, 60% labor force participation. <clears throat> All those structurally unemployed people that feel good about things and want to come back in labor force and try and get a job, um, you know, we've had a bit of that. You can see that, but still, it's still relatively flat at 63%. And so, right. And, and now, the rate hike, uh, yeah, because that, that was the Yellen administration uh, or the Yellen Fed, but now we've got a clearly hawkish tone where they don't care about <laughs> letting the economy run hot. They just want to get back to the old normal now. You know, and I think the expectation, uh, you can see it from the administration, is something like a four-handle GDP is possible. And, uh, and then as that, expecting that to happen with the tax plan, uh, maybe, and maybe other infrastructure changes, who knows what else. Um, but, but assuming right. that that 4% is even possible, which we don't think it is, um, uh, then that can drag up rates, and so rates will, will come up with that. It's normal, right? Well, you know, the thing to be possible. Yeah, I mean, it was easy to get to a four percent growth rate when you had two percent population growth, and you basically had to just add another two percent on top of that. So, t whereas today we have something closer to a half percent population growth, and so and 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 those population growth numbers include immigration, so that, that's everything included. And, and so, you know, it just becomes a lot harder to get to four percent when you don't have that cushion of um, additional people, uh, you know. Pushing GDP because, of course, of the increase in demand and, and, and everything that does in an economy. We did have one question I wanted to address before we jump into the new scenario. The question, is there a way to show the degree of tightening that has occurred, including not just the Fed tightenings, but also LIBOR increases, uh, Fed reduction of its balance sheet, and so on? Uh, to that, I would say that I, we actually think, you know, and, and a lot of this data that we're showing today, I would say it shows uh, that, you know, it, some of the indicators we're looking at with the yield curve, for instance, the 210 spread, uh, actually capture a lot of the information you want because LIBOR is actually highly correlated, depending on which LIBOR you're looking at, uh, which term, it's highly correlated to the same term of treasury. So one-year LIBOR is extremely highly correlated to the 12-month T-bill, for instance. Not to say that the rate is exactly the same, but it moves in the same way, generally speaking. And so, um, so, so probably not that much difference there. And then in terms of the Fed reducing its balance sheet, well, they haven't really taken the big steps there yet. They've started to, you know, just dabble in that, but they so far have um, indicated they want to work more with rate hikes than with uh, <clears throat> unwinding the balance sheet. In the Yellen in the Yellen era, at least, there was there were kind of arguments being made that they they felt that the Fed felt that um, the current larger balance sheet maybe was justified. And they didn't see any hurry. I mean, Janet Yellen's famously, you know, she was quoted as saying that she expected the balance sheet to not be normalized until 2025, which she said this in like 2015 or something. So basically never. <laughs> it's another way to interpret that because it's so far in the future that you can't predict what's really going to happen. And, and so we'll see what uh, the Powell Fed, what their opinion is on that. But so far, not that much has been done there. It's really a focus on rate heights and, and on rates, and I think that's where to, to keep your eyes. You know, one thing that's not talked about is how much, uh, after the second there was an election and uh, there was a hawkish tone from Trump, the, the, the kind of surprise winner, then all of a sudden uh, the, the Yellen Fed was jeopardized, right? Whatever that move was of, of dovishness, of going slow, taking their time, celebrating the market victory, all that came to a, a, a halt pretty immediately. And so what, what was the case was a, a Fed chair 
that was the only Democrat in Washington at that point. And so, you know, the, because the Fed became so politicized, along with other uh, government bodies, really Yellen's bet, bet, best bet was to say we're unwinding, have that marketing, and then just, you know, go out with the go out with the administration or as a, as a Democrat that tried to to uh, unwind the balance sheet. At least the rhetoric was that. But the moves underneath were not that, not at all. And so... Right, just sort of the, the basic tentative steps in, in hiking rates. I mean, it's worth noting that, that of course, uh, as we all know, until until January of this year, the market had continued to be red hot well, between, between, you know, at some point, and actually if we look back at this chart one last time, and we, we focused on it, but somewhere in that 2014, 2015 era, when labor force participation stopped declining, this is kind of where you can mark the, the economic growth in a way took over. <clears throat> so we stop having a decline here. Folks are at least joining the labor force at the same rate as population growth, which means that now you're starting to see, you know, over the last couple of years, this is the, the heart of the economic cycle, maybe the business cycle. And, 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 and so some of this growth is very much legitimate growth based on that versus, say, growth based on uh, Fed moves alone. All right, well, let's talk about the new scenario now and this idea of, of new Fed hawks and uh, how things might play out from here. Raj, so, so what is the, you know, what's the tone of our update here? You know, Fed unwinding is potentially a hawkish move as well. So, you know, what changes? Yeah, so the, if, you, if you remember the unwinding, you know, we discussed that in May of 2017. And the big move, um, the, the big idea on the downside was that the Fed would purposefully pierce this asset a bubble, right? And they 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 did exactly that in the mid '80s. Um, I don't think they banked on a one day 25% hit, <laughs> but it did it did serve its purpose, which was just uh, you know a momentary burp while uh, the market could continue to rise. And within 12 months, it recovered. <clears throat> it was not an economic hit; it was a market hit because of uh, irrational exuberance. And so Guy Fawkes was very appropriate. Uh, you know, the surprise and the Fed with a, kind of an agenda at that time. Okay, cut to 2018, and you've got now a uh, much more hawkish, actively hawkish um, Fed, but also also they're, they're super capitalist. You know, they want GDP growth. They want that stuff. They, they want both those things. Uh, they're, they're kind of envisioning that mid-'90s or even, let's say, the Reagan era where you have GDP traveling up and pulling rates up. And so with that, you know, it was very much time to introduce a new scenario. Um, and because, as Praveen said, the unwinding was more rhetoric than substance, uh, we decided to change the motif and introduce uh, a new scenario, roughly. Right. I mean, I think it's also worth noting that historically, uh, certainly over the last decade or so, prior, prior to that, perhaps the, the, this was less, I don't know, maybe everything's, maybe everything's become partisan today, as you noted, Raj, but it's certainly the case over the last decade that Republican Federal Reserve governors tend to be more hawkish. There is um, within the party a little more um, interest in uh, controlling inflation, but also in the idea that if rates are not zero, if they're higher than zero, then savers actually get uh, rewarded for saving. And so some of those are kind of reasons that it's viewed as positive that rates should rise from here, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the the Fed governors, and it's important to note that um, the president has, uh, you know, is in the process of replacing uh, a good portion of the uh, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, and so you'll see some of those kind of viewpoints take take hold more and more now, and kind of be the the standard consensus, as opposed to in the Yellen era, she made it really clear that her goal was maximum employment first and inflation perhaps second. Now, it so happened that inflation was close to zero in a lot of that, a lot of her tenure anyway, but uh, but she was very much trying to push uh, for employment. As we saw on the previous slides, it didn't necessarily work out. But anyway, that was the idea behind so much of the QE that really ended up going into asset prices. Um, yeah. So, it, it, so we, you know, we do see a difference in political opinion as well. During during taper, she <clears throat> was ironclad. You know, every, every month, uh, much less, um, uh, fed money in the system, right? But when it came to rate hikes, she was very accommodating. The, that Fed was very, very accommodating. They, there were several times they put the brakes on 
and chose not to raise. And guess what? It mm-hmm. was it was totally correlated with market volatility. You know, the second there was a, to be fair to her, there were some big <clears throat> there were some big hiccups, right? A euro crisis, a, a Greek default, um, all kinds of stuff. So so, but the last two years, I mean, it was all priced into the market, and then with the election, that totally took over. And so now, you know, the the idea of this Fed rebirth, this idea of a Fed being relevant again, or central bank move being uh, market moving. And so this Fed, I guarantee you, if Janet Yellen was in charge of the Fed here, we wouldn't have had the rate hike we did on Wednesday, right? That's right. More more tendency to move happened. a little bit slower. Right. More tendency uh, so to move a little slower. So to that is is uh, because. No, that that was a normal thing when the Fed when the Fed did a rate hike, there was that kind of um, downside move. But because the the Yellen Fed was so accommodating, um, people got people got used to that uh, devishness. Right. Well, let's walk through uh, you know the the scenarios we that we've put together, or rather the update here, Raj, and also we'll, and we'll take a look at them on hidden levers in a moment. Um, I know oh, it looks like oh, we have a typo in the slide here, but um, we'll, we'll show this on, online as well. But minus 35% actually is the ugly. So it's not minus nothing. I think you can just type it's, that in. Yeah, we can, we, can, we can fix the slide in real time, right? So if I yeah. put that that's in, so because that's do. the number that we... There All you right. go. <laughs> so. Okay, fantastic, Praveen. Let's, let's go through these, uh, uh, the good, bad, ugly here. Now, you know, if you, if you look at the Fed test test, the way they set up their scenarios with that mac, macro risk parity, that's exactly where we got that, right? And so we, we try to have that thematic upside downside uh, uh, conversation as opposed to just some shot in the air as to thinking what's going to happen. Right? As a fiduciary, you're way better off. As in, When you're in PM construction mode, you're also better off because you're considering the opposite uh, possibility and you, you're checking, out, checking your ego. Okay, so new Fed hawks, how's that look? The old normal? Uh, we guess that's still possible that you know we're maybe not for handle, but GDP pulling up treasuries, right? And those kind of traveling together uh, and having some high beta to each other. In such a case, you'd see uh, double digit market moves up, uh, GDP uh, in the well in the threes, and uh, a 10 year rate that isn't too much higher than it is now, uh, but a little bit higher. Uh, a bad scenario, this in the Fed unwinding era, this would have been ugly. But now it's uh, it's actually just bad, and that's an immediate bubble pop, uh, heavy twenty heavy move to twenty percent. Uh, we're definitely in this of these scenario outcomes. I think this is the one we're closest to for me. You know, it's not over one day, but that that year of nineteen eighty seven was uh, a piercing of this uh, asset price bubble, and the Fed right. really intended intended that. Um, right, and we, as we, we've discussed this the, before, right? The idea yeah, that yeah. Greenspan. Well, just the idea that Greenspan raised rates, uh, I think, over 200 basis points that year. And so that was one of the catalysts for 87. And so that's kind of why we bring it back up here. I mean, everybody remembers, you know, the the day of the crash and the fact that it was, you know, 20% a day. That's not what we're really alluding to here. It's more the the fact that there were many, many rate hikes leading up to that event. And, and that was one of the catalysts. Yeah. And, the, and that the Fed in, intended to do that. I don't think they intended one day of madness, but they did inve- intend to have uh, a little bit of air let out of the market specifically. Uh, so, Praveen, why, why are uh, the 10-year rates here higher than in, in the good scenario? Well, what's interesting is that the um, this scenario envisions that the um, this, that the new Fed will indeed remain hawkish in the face of. Uh, of you know asset prices being what they are of uh potentially that that risk of uh of the yield curve flattening and so this is this is the idea that okay they keep pushing and uh the economy is still growing it's important to note so this is not a recession scenario and that's in that sense it's actually very similar to 87 the late 80s like the 87 crash didn't have anything to do with a recession it was a momentarily a momentary asset price deflation and so that's the idea here what if rates rising because of an aggressive Fed, and that continues to push both short-term and long-term rates up. So you still have an upward sloping yield curve. But what if that essentially just pierces the asset price bubble 
you know, it's important to remember that when rates are higher, that makes fixed income more attractive as well, right? So money can move in that direction. But if money does move in that direction away from equities, uh, you know, that might also serve to cause this kind of, um, this kind of correction. Now, of course, we know that if, if everybody's bidding up treasuries and technically that lower the rates, but, but, but net net, there's that possibility that if the Fed is pushing on rates upward, that, that it could settle out just like it did in 87, where you have a sharp correction downward. And, uh, in the context of a, of an overall bull market, because this didn't end the long-term secular bull market at all in the 80s. It kept going. Right. And so I, I guess what you're saying is um, the three and a half on 10-year means that the Fed went too far. I do think if, if this down 20% happens, you know, that means they went too far too fast. Letting it out, right. letting it steam out of the market, slow and steady, um, is, is uh, we think, I mean, it's better for market participation than one huge down day that we talk about for 10 years after. <laughs> Right. And well, it's also worth noting that Greenspan stopped his rate hikes because of the 87 crash. So, you know, it could be a, a similar story as well if we do get, you know, a bubble pop. Right. But because of that hawkish tone, um, they, they, they may or may not have the political luxury to, uh, to stop and uh, do it leisurely. You know, they may have to truck forward because that's what they've represented to the world. How about the ugly scenario? Let's walk through that. Uh, so you think this is a proper recession? Well, yeah. So the ugly scenario, this is envisioning the same thing that we've been talking about in today's war room, which is that yield, the yield curve inverts. So let's say, let's, let's, let's play this out. <clears throat> let's say that, uh, you know, and I think at this point it makes sense for me to go into, into hidden levers and go into the scenario library and pull it up. But let's say that I go into the new Fed Hawk scenario. And we look at the uh, yield curve inversion. And we'll update the slides here later today, so we'll have the new one. Well, let's say that the that the ten year stays relatively flat at three percent. The twelve months, the so one year rates go up to around three percent, which of course means that two year rates are going to be greater than ten year rates. That's the negative. Uh, that's the negative two ten spread. Which, if I show here, we see the two ten spread at around negative twenty basis points. So that's that's the two ten spread going negative, and. Uh, what we've learned, of course, is that, you know, in today's war room is that that correlates with recessions. So if a recession plays out, what is the typical impact of a recession that follows that kind of inversion? And the answer is that that's going to be in that mid 30 percentile range. So, so that's why we're, we're showing a, a crash down into the 1700 range for the S&P here. So very substantial, you know, no way around that, <clears throat> that, that, that that's a substantial move. Also, a, uh, if it's a real recession, you know, getting GDP growth that actually goes down to around minus, uh, minus 0.5%. So on both counts, that's, that's very much a, a real correction and real recession and not just a, um, maybe like a market event. Hey, Praveen, I just noticed that old deck actually from uh, last May and how prescient it was. If you go back to the site, now this is the Fed unwinding uh, scenario, right? Well, with the four takeaways there, you look in the bottom left, rising rates, self-defeating for that Trump agenda, which was very fresh at that time. That has absolutely uh, been proven true. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, with the market having stalled now uh, as, as rates rise. And of course, there's, there, there are multiple reasons for everything. You know, we have valuations which are maybe stretched as well. But, uh, but yeah, absolutely, that rising rates aren't... Uh, if the market is one of the barometers that is being used to to kind of the, the administration has used at times to point to its success, well, then I think raising rates one. rapidly. I well, raising rates one. rapidly certainly hasn't helped that. Yeah, it has been. It has been pointed to for sure. So, um, in, in fact, that, the tax plan was what you know the the tax plan came at the kind of you're pointing out business cycle, and uh, so introducing the tax plan then was what led us to this, what we'll call the twilight zone, you know, it really extended on the business cycle. But, but if you follow that up, that tax plan pop, which is now priced in with rate hikes, then, you know, you're not going to advance the stock market with that. And that's been, right. That's well, becoming more one point with, with respect to, yeah, one, one point with respect to this tax plan, I'd note is that it, with the old normal scenario, I mean, that's, and that's the most positive scenario our most positive outcome within with, within uh, the Fed scenario 
one of the ideas there is that the fiscal stimulus of a tax cut, you know, because we did get that this year and it is going to raise earnings this year, that that might help extend the market cycle and maybe the business cycle, uh, you know, if, if things play out positively, that that would be the positive benefit of it. Hey, all business cycles come to an end. You can't um, revoke that, but, <clears throat> but it is possible to stretch it. Uh, sometimes some would argue that stretching it actually makes the uh, coming recession therefore worse. But at the same time, you know, in, in the short to medium term, that would be the positive, you know, positive way that this plays out, that, that the tax cut and, you know, the, the stimulus and then also just the underlying economic growth that that pushes the cycle out uh, a little bit further than it might otherwise go. Okay. All right, you know, one thing that one thing I want to note also, Raj, in terms of scenarios, and as we're talking now here in Hidden Levers, so the Fed Hawk scenario, that, that's, the, that's the update to the Fed unwinding. Rising interest rates has been very popular for a long time with, uh, with advisors using hidden levers and, and, and PMs as well. I wanted to note a difference between the two, though, and it's a difference that is, um, that's important. And what that difference is, is the um, – let, let me just drive into that real quick. The difference would be with the rising rate scenario, we talked about a potential for growth-driven rise in rates, wage inflation, and then even commodities inflation. So we really did, you know, try to look at it from multiple different perspectives. But one of the things that we really didn't focus on so much here was this potential idea of a yield curve inversion. And so that's really what, I, you know, if there's, a, if there's a scenario outcome that's different and new, it's the yield curve inversion. And, and the reason that's worth uh, Taking into account, you know, as you're as you're looking at different scenarios or you're stress testing your portfolio, it's the potential impact. Yes, there's a you know substantial S and P downside tied to that, but also just the fact that short term rates are moving, but not long term rates. So it actually has a different potential impact on your investments uh, as compared to uh, other rising rate scenarios or rising rate scenarios you may have looked at or or even looked at with more simplistic tools that maybe only look at um, interest rates as being sort of one point as opposed to there being a whole yield curve. And, and so this is, this is really looking at that, that fact. And Praveen, let, you know, what you're saying, that's a fair warning to all you, all you folks that think uh, stress testing or some sort of um, impact analysis that might be in the marketing of a software player that's you know, big or popular, like a Riskalyze, or maybe you're using some of BlackRock's free tools around stress testing. Just know that you know this team has been doing this for nine years, coming from a, a trading floor, bringing that to a much more democratic place. And but at no point have we lost the nuance, and you know the complexity of the economy is only increasing. And so capturing that in a modeling, uh, in scenario math modeling is no short order. And so it's it, for for us that's been a labor of love, but capturing that and the nuance of each scenario uh, is more important for you because. As, as opposed to, you know, just a, a blanket proxying where all fixed income behave the same. We saw that in the oil crash um, uh, that many, many high yield bonds perform very differently depending on whether they're correlated to oil or not. And so that's where hidden levers is, shine. And so again, here right. in, um, in these moments of tension where there's rate hikes involved, maybe no inflation involved, you know, what's causing those rate hikes? And, and that, mm -hmm. that moves different levers in the economy and just, you know, one simple capital market assumption around where the S&P is and where interest rates are ain't you there. And so that's where, you know, right. we, we see people knocking on our door much more for our original value propositions around stress tests. Well, I'd quickly note, you know, looking at a stress test uh, here of, you know, we like to, uh, we've loaded into our, our war room test account, I guess, a couple of the, uh, the robo-advisor strategies. But, but I, I, I was looking at those and also looking at um, here just a, a portfolio with nothing but the aggregate bond fund. Just wanted to note that there is, of course, there's still risk in something like the aggregate bond fund uh, or, or a, a, a broad bond allocation, minus 5% over a year. That's including yield, actually. If you strip out yield, it's more like minus 8%. So it's not trivial, you know, the potential downside because of that short-term uh, rate increase that is going to have some, you know, negative impact on uh, some of the tenors of bonds that are, that are in a fund like that. But at the same time, 
if you look at broader impacts to whether that's, of course, the S&P itself or, uh, you know, some of these emerging markets funds and foreign investments are going to get hit much harder, small cap funds. So, excuse me, you can see that the relative outperformance of bonds is still very real and, uh, you know, it's something that's worth, worth noting. You, we even see, you know, real estate as a sector getting more negatively impacted. And that's important to note, you know, if I, if I pick on a single sector, I know there was a question asked about what are sort of relatively better and worse sectors. I'll pick on that only for a moment just because if rates are rising, it's important to note what does that do to um, mortgage rates and therefore how does that bleed through into the real estate sector. And so there is a, a knock-on negative effect, even though you think of those, you know, maybe as REITs as being equity-like, they do have that that uh, interest rate exposure. And so that, that's showing up here in the stress test on that Vanguard ETF. 